The director, Steve Weistrack. Thank you. So um, the first question that's asked in the film is uh, of, of Bob Manry is why? And then uh, the first question I ask you is why? Why did you make this film and why did you make it now? Okay, well let me um, <clears throat> answer the second question first because I, I, I don't know if I know any better than anybody else here what the answer to the first one is, but I provided as much evidence as I was able to find uh, I spent my, spent my career as a film editor and a film archivist, and I was a very avid offshore sailor. So I had read uh, most of the books about people sailing around the world and shorthanded or single-handed sailing. And I was uh, prepping a boat to sail to Hawaii in the mid-90s and was rereading uh, many of these books. And I uh, noticed on, uh, on that reading of Tinkerbell, which was probably the third or fourth time that I had read the book, that uh, in his equipment list at the end, it uh, said that he took a 16 millimeter movie camera. And so editing, archiving, sailing, it just sort of rang all the bells for me. And even though he died in 1971, I, I just asked the question, what happened to the film? And so that began what was a better part of a two-year search to uh, track it down. And eventually I found it in a cardboard box in the back of his brother, uh, brother's garage in Calgary, and, and who told me that, oh, yeah, if you want it, you can have it, because I was just going to throw it out next spring. You know? <laughs> so it was really with just uh, within months you know, that I happened to show up on his doorstep. And uh, and it, then you started. So you, this is the mid '90s you're talking about. The, yeah, that was um, in '97, I believe, when I actively started working on it. Okay, and then so describe the process from there. Well, um, after I found his footage, which was about an hour of uh, of the color footage, all of which is is included here, I. Uh, tracked down, well, in the course of finding it, I was able to find most of his surviving family. It was, had become a very disassociated family. There was a point where I was the only person in the world who knew how to get in touch with any or all of them. And so I set off to do some interviews uh, with the family. And then I found some of the other people, like Tom Pascura and Bill Jorgensen and so forth, who were all part of the story. And I just started interviewing them. And so when I had money, I would push the project along a little bit more. And, and when I didn't, then it you know, just sort of hit the doldrums for a while. Right. And uh, the production company is called 13 and a Half Foot Films. So it's based on the Tinkerbell. Correct. The whole production company. Um, and it, it becomes a story about media coverage as much as anything else, the, the press wars that went on, which is a fascinating story of its own. And did you get access to that film from Jorgensen and from The Plain Dealer and, and stuff like that? Well, yes. Um, one of the things that um, was in Manry's collection was a real that was uh, given to him by WEWS, it has a big bronze plaque on it, that um, is kind of most, uh, most of what they used of the footage that they shot on, on that trip. Um, but all of the WEWS news footage was donated to uh, a film archive uh, outside of Cleveland, and so I was able to find the rest. And then, you know, as you can see, there were, were media uh, companies from all over the world there. And so, um, you know, BBC or ITN or, you know, any of these uh, companies, I just uh, checked all of their, uh, their archives. And it, one of the reasons it took 21 years is because it took a long time to find some of this stuff. Uh, 25 years ago, there wasn't anything really cataloged online. Now you can go to a website and click a button and preview the clip. You know, so it was kind of an iterative process going back and trying to fill in the gaps. The final piece of the puzzle actually fell into place um, a little uh, last year. Um, 
when I got a hold of Virginia's diary that she kept during that summer, and she noted that he was going to be on I've Got a Secret. And I knew that he had been on some show, but was never able to identify what it was. And uh, so then, uh, very quickly after that, uh, I was able to, to track that down. And uh, the company that owns it, they only have a, what's called a digibeta tape, which is kind of the end of videotape broadcasting um, you know, the format that you would use. Uh, and I, I was just really you know, disappointed. But I found uh, an original kinescope at the UCLA Film Archive. So uh, now Fremantle has a beautiful 2K scan of their show. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. <laughs> just a quick question. Um, was that edited, the, the sequence from I've Got a Secret, was it edited at all? Because it seemed like they guessed really fast. Uh, oh, oh, well, it, yes, it's certainly edited here. Um, but uh, as it turns out, they, they knew pretty quickly who it was. And the way that game worked was each of those four panelists had a $20 bill, basically. Mm -hmm. And if, um, if the first person didn't guess it, then the guest would get that $20. And they all wanted him to get all $80. <laughs> so they, they just kind of sort of toyed with it, you know, to run out the segment. Uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful thing. So um, I also saw in the last credits that uh, the animation for the, the hallucination sequences uh, was, came from another film? Uh, well, he made a film that uh, he would take out on the road and, uh, from what I can tell, did a live narration on occasion. He mostly gave slide lectures. He was very, very successful on the lecture circuit for a number of years. And um, in the course of making that footage, he worked with an uh, art student at um, Cleveland Institute of Art who created all of the paintings and did all the animation. So we took footage from, from you know, that sequence and rearranged it and so forth. It, it, it was just one big eight minute long block that kind of just you know, went on and on. So, so we you picked it apart and re-edited that, that right. together and put yeah. sound to it. And Correct. Other things. Yeah, right. That's right. Um, well, it was very effective. Um, Interesting that he would put that together. Then you say he was successful on the lecture tour for a long time, for a number of years. But I mean, he didn't live that long after the after the the cruise. So no, he, no, he didn't. Um, his book was a big international uh, success. I think it was published in over two dozen languages. Um, and but he was on the road um, pretty much continuously from '66. Um, until 67, and then that's when the family made that year-long cruise. And then following that, um, he kept making uh, lectures, but they became uh, less frequent after Virginia died. Right. You know? um, and uh, uh, th this whole thing really caused a lot of problems for the kids. You know? um, uh, uh, in the very end, you see that this is the first time uh, that Robin had seen the boat in 50 years. And she just has really kind of pushed the whole thing uh, away because it, you know, it created a lot of trauma for them for, yeah, sure for various did. reasons. And right. in fact, um, when they saw this film, I, I, uh, certain things I think fell into place for them. They're, they're very grateful that it's, it's been well, done. That's, that's, that's a very good thing, indeed. Um, a, a, another technical question is, um, his footage, um, it didn't have any sound with it. No. It? No. So you put sound to it. Yes. I mean, there's, no, there's scoring, which is very effective, but there's also sounds of waves, sounds of wind, other things like that. So how did you match that all up? Where did you get all that stuff together from? Well, there are um, you know, uh, large libraries of, uh, of sound effects and so forth. Uh, I worked with a sound designer. Um, the, the editor, Steve Armstrong, uh, has a, a good sense of sound effects. Um, I, I was, uh, I spent my career as an editor, so, you know, I sprinkled in a few here and there that I thought would help and so forth. And, you know, it's just um, trying to build a soundscape that, 
fits effectively, you know, to, to try to amplify the story and the images. I think it was tremendously effective. Um, and uh, the, who was the voice of the person who described the landing at Falmouth and the welcome that he got in that day? Yeah, well, that, uh, uh, that's Stephen that? Callahan, okay. uh, who you saw earlier uh, in the film. He, uh, Callahan, uh, some of you may not know, many of you probably do, was, um, uh, was a quite famous American sailor who um, uh, wrote a book called Adrift, which is a story of his voyage across the Atlantic in which he struck a boat and his boat sank and he had to get into a life raft and he drifted for 76 days back across the Atlantic until he was rescued in the West Indies. And in the, in the first three pages of Adrift, he credits uh, Robert Manry as the inspiration really of his life's um, uh, love of sailing. And uh, he read it when he was 10 and he's you know been sailing ever since. So. You know, uh, Manry is kind of this monotone, everything is just wonderful, you know. <laughs> and the laugh. Yeah, right. The crazy and, laugh. And so I really wanted something, you know, to kind of give a little bit more gravitas about really what it's like, you know, to be out in the ocean, you know, no, uh, well, it was these uncanny. vast expanses. The, the voice I was thinking of, though, was a British guy who he and his oh, family oh, oh. got into the yes. showroom and the, he described all the madness and Falmouth oh. and everything else. Okay, who yeah. was that guy? How'd you yeah. get a hold of him? Well, uh, his name is uh, Miles Stradinic and I met him through the website that I've had for many years on this project and he had contacted me and told me that, um, you know, would I be interested in seeing the story of, of his encounter, which of course I was, and it's up on the website. And those three photographs of Manry signing his autograph book and so forth, those were the three pictures that he sent me. And so uh, he grew up in Falmouth, he lived there, he, you know, as, as you heard, he uh, knew all about it. And so uh, yeah, he's a playwright uh, in England and uh, I, I just, was so grateful that when I went over there and, and he drove many hours to come down to Falmouth and, and meet me. I did a interview with him in the famous Green Bank Hotel. And, Beautiful uh, hotel. <laughs> yeah. Um, so all of this goes to um, you during the course of this 24 years, have 20 some odd years that you were making the film. Uh, have you done a lot of single-handed sailing in that I, time? I, well, um, in 97, no, not single-handed sailing. Um, in 97, I did cross to um, LA to um, uh, the Big Island, Honokahau um, Harbor. Um, it was uh, double-handed. I, I was always looking actually for a third hand, but I, I couldn't ever find one to commit. Uh, it pencils out as 18 days. It took us 17 days and 23 hours, so we were pretty much <laughs> On target, on and then I've made some other small boat voyages, mainly out to Bermuda, okay. uh, as far as offshore. From where? Um, one was from uh, Fort Lauderdale, and one was, uh, I think it was New Haven. Uh, I'm trying to think where we left from. Somewhere up here in, in Connecticut. Right. I grew up on the Sound, on okay. the other side. And how big were your boats? Uh, to Hawaii, it was a 43-foot uh, 43 uh, 43 Polaris, um, which is a kind of a flush deck Valiant. Uh, and then the other boats, I don't really remember uh, what the design was, but they were about 48 feet, I think. It was a crew of six. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm going after the fact that a 13 and a half foot boat is so, so tiny. I mean, that is, I mean, the fact that he built a cabin on it is kind of a, a <laughs> remarkable uh, all by itself, just yeah. putting a cabin on it. And it looks mm -hmm. like he knew what he was doing with that. Yeah. Um, but then to take that out in the ocean, uh, 13 and a half foot, I mean, that is just tiny. I mean, um, a lot of people here, I'm sure, have sailed and, uh, and been out in, in the bay and other places in boats that size or usually a lot bigger than that. Right. Um, and every boat feels tiny in the middle of the ocean. That, There's that's no true. question about that. That's every right. boat feels tiny. Yeah, so it's uh, just a matter of proportion a at a certain point. You know? And, and the, the character of the man, um, just the, sort of the determination and sort of the, the, the laid back attitude about what he was doing Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that, it, well, yeah, I was a little upset that I got knocked in the water. Yeah, how many times did it happen? Six times. 
It's like, okay, once would be enough. I mean, <laughs> right. I used to have to dive a boat. I had a uh, prop trouble with mm -hmm. a power boat, and mm -hmm. I had to dive the boat uh, in 40 fathoms. And you get in the water in 40 fathoms, it's like, it's very scary. Yeah, it's, right. not a, it's not a good thing to do. But in 13 and a half foot boat, I just couldn't even imagine it. I was watching that boat bob around, and I was just uh, sort of blown away by that. But I, I, I have to say, you, your tribute to his passion, your passion in the pursuit of this is absolutely remarkable, and I'm so grateful that you brought this story to us. Really well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.